Welcome to True House Stories. I'm Lenny Fontana coming out of New York City. And this week, we focus our attention to UK legend DJ that helped create a scene amongst two others that was called the Dream Team. He's still going strong. He's a radio presenter, TV host. He's on BBC Two, if I remember, BBC Five, but he'll correct me on that one as well. What a fantastic show. He stays true to the sound, but yet he's elegant in every way. I'd like to welcome to the stage DJ Spoonie from the UK, London, UKG scene. Thank you, Lenny. Thank you for having me. Um, an absolute honor, I must say. Um, yeah, delighted to be here and can't wait to share some stories and hear some stories um, because, uh, you know, your background and where you grew up and the stuff that you experienced, the music, the scene there, um, heavily influenced the start of our beloved UK garage scene. So, you know, I can't wait to uh, pick up the stories and pick up the uh, proverbial baton on this and, and, and run with it. Well, you know, it's not every day I get to meet someone that changes or creates a scene, help in a sense, where I know you guys were inspired by Tony Humphreys, Trouble Anderson with the Soulful House sounds of the UK, should I say New York City, New Jersey Gospel House vibes that came with, say, Armand Van Helden on the bass lines and this one and that one. We were all doing our stuff back in the day, masses at work. But then you guys took your own and created UK Garage. Not to say that Spirit of the Sun is not cool. one of the strongest records in that scene because Mr. Norris the Boss Windross always says to me that that record, my record, I should say, seems to be one of those catalog records that you guys, you know, championed back. But, man, you know, the Dream Team is no joke. And this is part of why I asked you to come on because you're relevant now. You're eloquent, relevant, and you're still going strong. And if not, you're not, I don't see an ignition being shut off on your part. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't see the ignition. In fact, I see the, there's this thing like in that movie, they put that 11 over the 10. And why do they have it at 11? <laughs> why? Why? Because there's nothing better than going an extra click to make it louder. And I'm going to assume that's where you're rolling. Listen, that is exactly what we're um, it's what we're trying to do. I just want to mention a couple of other names before I go on, because when you get to this age, it's very easy to forget stuff. Um, but that early that that New York, um, New Jersey sound that you spoke about, um, Eddie Perez and Smack Productions were absolutely pivotal to the UK garage sound. Um, you mentioned Louis, you mentioned Kenny. Uh, Kerry Chandler, um, another one that falls in, into that bracket. Um, you had uh, Lem Springsteen. You had, you know, all of, all of these guys. That, that that early, that early sound for us was 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 everything. And yeah, you know, we we I'd, I'd say developed, not in the sense of it was underdeveloped, but we we kind of interpreted it in our own way. We then came up with our versions of that sound and and you know here we are but the beautiful thing is that after all of this time i've been doing this full time now for 27 years that we're still doing shows and we're doing arguably bigger shows than we were back then okay pause here goes the question and then we start right from there because i love the 27 so when you were a kid young let's say middle to high school how did music find you or you find the music so so the interesting thing i was always i was always a lover of of music and i was quite quite athletic so i used to do all and most sports i played for my school in football or what you'd call soccer i was on the track team i played a bit of basketball and a little bit of cricket so i was a little bit of an all-rounder but outside of school and playing football, I absolutely loved and adored my music. And when I was about 15, I saw a friend of mine um, 
he was DJing at our local youth club and I saw him do a, let's just call it a transition because I wouldn't have called it a mix then, but he went from one track to another without pausing. Now, I knew both of the records, but I'd never heard, I was like, how did you go from that to that without stopping with no pause? Because at the time we I were used to listening to um, the reggae and the soul sound systems and they largely played with one turntable. So Steve then said to me, it's a thing called mixing. And I was like, right, I want to learn how to do that. I was 15. And he came over to my house a few days later, spoke to me about the theory of, of mixing. At that time, I did have an understanding of music because I was playing a trombone in the school orchestra. So I understood, you know, phrasing and structures and bars and and, and that sort of that element of music. And then he he came and uh, told me what to do, showed me what to do. And I immediately picked it up and, and that was it really. Now, whether that's me finding music or music giving me the opportunity to find it. And that was it. I then just started practicing diligently. I was scratching and mixing and mixing and scratching. And yeah. Um, was there a hero for you? Was there a hero like musician or DJ? that you said, oh my God, I want to do this or be like this? I mean, growing up, I was, it, it was really, it was a real weird, whether it be the universe made it happen like this, or it was a coincidence or a combination of both. I, I lived on, I lived on a, an, an estate in, in Hackney, which is part of East London. And on my estate, or at least within a 10 minute walk to my front door, were some of London's thus the UK's finest turntable DJs. Um, one being DJ Ron, the other one being DJ Hype. Then we had some big name DJs who um, ran sound systems. So Alistair Rap Attack, um, Norman J. And I say these guys were massive. Going to Notting Hill Carnival and standing and seeing these sound systems play and these DJs standing there like music gods i was like this is this is just a beautiful thing to be able to have such a beautiful and positive effect on people's moods and that moment in their life i was like i i absolutely want to do this so you know my musical heroes all came from you know largely not too far from where i lived um which meant that actually if you wanted to be recognized and respected you had to really be about your craft because you know i wasn't even the third fourth fifth fifth, fifth best dj on my estate <laughs> so you know by by that definition it just meant that i i grew up in a tough school but a brilliant school nonetheless so spoonie so tell us this <laughs> so there was no at that time no sync button no you had to you had to learn how to beat mix right you had to learn how to be a true selector yeah, and, and the funny thing is, so in, in in reggae and the soul sound systems, where they largely used to play with one deck and an effects chamber, an outboard, um, that they would play effects in between the records and they'd have an MC that would speak in between the records. So the selector, selection part of DJing was very, very important because you didn't have another deck to create the vibe. And then it went into what we were doing now where we had the technical skills and ability to create a vibe, but I had already understood the importance of selection. So I was then trying to fuse the two. So it wasn't like when I watched the world uh, DJ championships for argument's sake, some of the stuff that they're doing, you wouldn't necessarily do in a club because in a club you're trying to make people dance. But I did enjoy the technical aspect of what they're doing, and I love what they do. And I just try and combine, try and combine the selector element to it. So then you are, you know, that's that's what I love to do. We all like to be selectors, right? Sure. At that time, what year would you say that was about the DMC thing that you talking? I mean, about? when I started seeing the DMC, this might have been late nineties, um, and I know they've been going longer than that. Um, there was another guy from. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if he was from, he was from South London, DJ Pogo. And then there was a guy from North London called, oh, his name's just slipping me. It will come back. So they were, 
real DMC guys. But then, like I said, DJ Ron and uh, DJ Hype, uh, they were they were unbelievable. Uh, and and they were like I said, they were in my back garden. You know, I used to see them all the time. Um, well, one of them, one one sticks out for me that is a friend of ours, mm -hmm. CJ McIntosh. Oh wow! Because CJ was also a DMC champion before he started really playing house music. Yep. And doing remixing and all that. That was his, you know, his crack into the scene. The thing is that CJ, because he has been such a, you know, he's now a legendary producer, uh, remixer, that people forget that he was a genuine world-class turntablist. Um, you know, and some of my favorite house music productions have come at have come at the hands of CJ, the hands and mind of CJ McIntosh. So yeah, you're right. Um, I didn't know about CJ McIntosh at that time. Um, this came to me afterwards that, you know, do you realize he used to be a DNC champ? But and it doesn't surprise me because those guys are almost nerdy by definition. The time, oh. the time it takes to get one element of your performance correct it's like i know it, the diligence that's required is no joke and don't forget your last thing i'll leave this to all the people viewing cj mcintosh is behind mars pump up the volume From that. <laughs> which is the first actual release where there's a crap load of samples that nobody cleared and everybody went crazy when it became a pop hit everywhere <laughs> It, such is such is the genius you know he's also uh behind an unbelievable um beautiful people remix so you know cj he's done so many so many amazing remixes i could do a cj mcintosh mixtape yeah, and he's exactly. really cool with, he's really cool with it as well like you learn you know growing up he was one of the people that i would pay to go and see and then you you know you enhance your own reputation so now you get to be behind the rope or behind the curtain where you're speaking to people like this. And I was always amazed at how humble he was in relation to how brilliant he was. And just thought to myself that there's no reason not to be cool when you're good, if you ever get the opportunity to be as good and as great as someone like him, you know? This is something I wanted to ask now that you're bringing this up. Before we get to your experience of what you did in your career on your path was there something that happened that you saw someone who was at greatness or you met one of your heroes that you said oh my god what an a-hole <laughs> something that makes you go i don't want to be that i want to be somewhat approachable you know what I, I i think luckily for me i can't say that i've and if I had met someone, I wouldn't mention them <laughs> right in this. Don't right mention the name. Don't mention the name. Just the experience. But, but I think, I, I, if I'm completely honest, Lenny, I, it was the argument came to me more the other way that when I've met some very great and special people, how cool they've been. And, you know, I, I remember being, I'm, I'm a big football fan. And I remember one time um, being at Anfield and being in the players, players' lounge. So after the game, the Liverpool players or all of the players come into this area and that's where their guests, their family and friends hang out. And I was friends with uh, Emil Heskey at the time who got me a ticket and I was waiting for him in the lounge and um, Michael Owen came in. And at the time, Michael Owen was the hottest player in world football, young player, the hottest world pl young player. And I watched him come in and just saw him say hello to everybody, be really cool, laugh and smile and take a picture. And I just said to myself, here is a guy who is a genuine international A-lister with regards to football. And look how cool, calm and humble he is. That's how you have to be. Like, so if you're going to achieve greatness, you just got to be cool. Like, look how cool he is. And, you know, I suppose... We don't like hanging out with dicks and being around dicks. There's no need for it. Um, but I, I definitely looked at that situation and said, yeah, that's how you should behave when you're up there, man. Well, you know why I mentioned that to you? Because 
God bless Charlie Murphy. May he rest in peace, Eddie Murphy's brother. When they used to do the true Hollywood stories of Rick James and what Rick James was like and, and, and behind the scenes. And we kind of read that stuff back in the day. There was no Googling back then. You, you only read those crappy papers like the Inquirer or, you know, that nasty paper in England, was it The Sun? And yeah. they would tell you these crazy, crazy stories. You know, I used to read stuff that said, I would never want to act or be that way or act, you know, ghetto fabulous, you know, yeah. coming from nothing. And then all of a sudden, like, I got everything. Mm -hmm. F you, you ain't nothing. I hate when people act. For me, yeah. it's more like respect the art and be humble and just be open. Like Pele, great sportsmen that yeah. come out and they're just so warm and you just go, wow, what a great guy. You know, or it's people like that because sometimes in this game it goes to their head. People say, mean, "I mean, this is the other thing that I suppose I've been, you know, fortunate enough to meet some of my, you know, if not heroes, but pe definitely people I look up to and respect." But I'm also very aware that before all of that, they are human beings first. So if they are in a bad mood for whatever reason, sometimes there's only like so much that you can put on a public face and if someone doesn't want to stop to take a picture or sign an autograph or whatever it is it doesn't necessarily mean that they are bad or horrible people they just might be in a slightly different zone I'm a human being and, I, and sometimes I might not be as amenable as I will at others but that's not because I'm a dick it's just because I don't know it, it could be that you've turned up at the wrong venue or there's no one there to take you to the decks or you're running late um you know you're rushing a little bit or whatever it could be there could be loads of different things that happen when people see and meet you out as to why you might not want to stand there for 10 minutes and take a picture but you know i'm never going to be rude to anybody i might say look i'm rushing can we come back or can i do it in a moment um i'm always mindful of how i speak to people sure because it's a it should be a human trait right no of course you know speaking of your story and how it all begins you know, and I like the thing that you are musically trained with the trombone. That that helps a lot when you're, you know, getting into a position of becoming a DJ. And I say loosely, I wouldn't, I don't play my trombone in front of any and anybody. <laughs> um, if you like to hear Spoonie play his trombone, <laughs> may, send some messages to uh, BBC and beg him. Anyway, <laughs> um, you know, any kind of musical training helps, especially yeah. when you go in the studio. But before we even get to the studio part, you know, there's, there's the part of the DJ. And, you know, being around all that talent growing up on your estate area. And then, you know, you got Norman and his brother Joey and Hype and all these people around you. It is an inspirational thing. Plus, as, you know, a young, a young guy... You're going out to clubs and, you, and you're getting to see how the DJ is becoming the center of the universe in the room, mm -hmm. okay? Which makes you want to go after it even deeper, harder, mm -hmm. okay? How does that start to become the journey for you as far as you learn the craft, you've watched the others, how do you get your first DJ gig? How do you get your first radio gig? How do you create the gosh damn dream team? You know, what's all these parts? Yeah. I'm going to let you tell that story, brother, man. I mean, the, the, the truth is, I'm not even sure if, if I create. I think what happens is you stay true to your, to your craft and to your profession. And these things can happen as as byproducts. So if I go back to the point of um, when I decided that I was going to leave my full-time job and go and try and be a full-time DJ, I was about, I was 26, maybe just turned 27 at the time, or definitely coming up to my 27th birthday. And I had about three months worth of bookings in my diary, which I knew could sustain my expenses at that time um and i know three months isn't far to look ahead but that's that's how i looked at it and i and i then just thought my job and my mission now is to ensure that i've got three months worth of bookings ahead every week so as one week falls off there's another week's coming in that was like a real basic simple 
part of my mind. But by then, I'd already done shows on pirate radio. And I I think my first sort of big DJing gig, I, I would say was at um, working for Garage City, um, you know, Bobby and Steve and Mickey Zoo. And I, I used to go to the venue and check out the vibe and hear, you know, the brilliant DJs play, of course, Paul Trouble Anderson, uh, Ricky Morrison, who ended up being, you know, a very good friend of mine. Um, the Americans that would come over who most probably won't remember me back then, but the likes of Terry Hunter and, you know, Dana Down was here and DJ Disciple. Um, and you'd get to meet and, but I used to listen to them and go, well, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm at that level, but I just need, I just need the breaks, but you need to be cool with it. It wouldn't have been right for me to go into Bobby and Steve and say, look, I heard you play on the weekend, but I can do that. It was like more, listen, I come to the club and I love what you guys play and I'm making tapes and doing this kind of thing. And, you know, I guess I, I got an opportunity and then you practice, then you just enhance it and then you create a little vibe and then you go on the radio and you present the music well and you present the music well and then people want you at their venues and then it just kind of continues to snowball and that's really where the hard work starts. Um, you know, the dream team, that we, we we're all on pirate radio station together and i used to listen to um uh, timmy who's the one in the middle um i'm the one with the cap on mikey b's the other one so mikey used to do a show on a sunday timmy used to do a show on a saturday afternoon and mikey um when i spoke earlier about the combination of a selector and a uh technical dj so mikey was very much the selector and Timmy was a very technical DJ. I'm not saying that they both didn't have technical ability or or, or, or the relevant uh, selecting ability, but I was somewhere, I saw myself as somewhere in the middle and appreciating what both of them did. Um, and and it started out very much as a professional respect for, for, for Timmy and Mikey. And then we spoke and then we kind of got together and we were doing a gig, we were doing a gig and I, I wrote an ad and had to come up. I, I wrote the ad and it was missing something and I couldn't work out what it was. It just didn't sound, sound finished. And I slept on it and I woke up in the morning and I was like, I've got it. London's dream team. And and that was it really. Um, we started out as London's dream team, Timmy Magic, Mikey B and myself. And then we changed the spelling because Obviously, you had the dream team, the American basketball team was spelt as the traditional dream team. So I then thought for marketing and identification purposes that we would change the EA to double E and double E. Um, as you can see there, um, that was a combination, a compilation album we did for Sony where uh, it's a double CD where one of the CDs is all UK Garage and then the other CD is just a mix of records that we love reggae drum and bass soul it's all on the second cd and i think uh without exception that's our favorite favorite project that we've uh that we've done and, and so on. you so you began on the pirate radio stations correct yes okay and the other guys were on the pirate radio station at the same station yes what was the station called london underground correct i remember that east london right yeah 89.4 that's right. And it was about a five to 10 mile stretch, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it was. and But it's amazing that a five, 10 mile radius doesn't sound that much. But the, it it's was huge. A very, very popular radio station. Very, very popular. Radio Before station. you guys be create this concept, the dream team, each one of you have a radio show, correct? That's right. And on that show, at that time, you were playing a lot of the American garage garage or should i say garage yep. or american garage sound right i definitely was funny funny that i definitely was more than timmy and mikey so even though we were sonically in tune there was a slight different feel to who was playing at any one time so if we played back to back you could close your eyes and go i know mikey's playing that sounds like timmy that's most probably spoony so you know i would have if I think at the time there might have been tunes like, say like when Oyakama Vach came out, that would have been a track that I would have played 
absolutely would have played first because that was kind of like my groove. It was a little bit more soulful. Um, I mentioned Beautiful People earlier. Days Like This by Sean Escoffrey, you know, Spinner's Mix of that. That kind of, I would have played that kind of house and garage um, as well as, you know, stuff like Play With The Voice, Joe T. Vanelli. Um, I would have been playing, you know, Kathy Brown, uh, Get Well Soon, Kathy. All of the stuff on cutting records, I would have been across all of that stuff. And maybe right. the... so when the strictly rhythm stuff came in on oh. the on the wall, all the cutting oh. stuff that came in on the wall, all the nervous stuff that came yeah. in on the wall, you would have had all pieces of, of that in your set, correct? Well, it's all over there. <laughs> it's, it's literally over there. On the American I, side, mate. Yeah, on the American side. So I could turn the camera around because you've got the, the UK and European side there. See that? And, and then that's the all the American library. Look at that, everyone. The library in, in Spoonie's and home. Behind me, that's all the soul, funk, reggae, disco. Well, not all of it, because there's some in another room. But anyway, we digress. He's a librarian. That that but that's that, you know, that was my music, uh, my music taste, you know, maxi records, emotive, emotive. I used to love emotive as a record label. Um and um, Charles Dawkins, James Howard. I mean, the names yeah. go on and on. Michael Watford, uh, you know, I, I think there, there was a point when if I saw a track released on Nervous Strictly with Michael Watford on vocals, <laughs> I, I wouldn't even it. listen to it. I would just, yeah, you buy just it. grab it. You I just knew. Just it. That's the you truth. knew. You knew what you were getting. Anything on anything that Eddie Perez um, had produced produced or paid keys on or engineered, I would just buy it. So at that time, before you guys come together, you're already now, what job did you have up to that point that you left? So I was, I, out of school, I worked uh, for the employment service. So I was effectively a civil servant, getting people, getting people jobs. So my job was to get people back into work. And I did that for seven years. And then I decided that I wanted to try and give myself a better opportunity with a DJ in. So then I I wasn't able to leave my nine to five or leave a full-time job, but I left that full-time job. Um, and then I went to work for a company that uh, repaired what were then called Apple Macintosh computers. So I used to sell the maintenance contracts uh, for the max and um, that was it very small company but very brilliant um had a great time there was only five of us in the in the business i was i was the the salesperson um i was there for about a year and then the dj started to take off i asked the boss could i go to four days a week um because the dj and i'm out on sunday nights and getting into work on a monday so he said okay um so I went down to four days a week. And with that, the DJ just grew. Then I went back to him about three months later and said, can I go three days a week? So I didn't, I was off Fridays and Mondays and worked Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And then again, it went, took off again. And within six months, I said, right, that's it. Mate, you had country club hours, mate. That's yeah. country clubbing now. Now you get the, 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 you have, you're there less than the bosses even that. They're like, <laughs> managers going, yeah, who's this guy? He's never here. He gets a yeah. check. But I, listen, I, the thing, the thing is, Lenny, I, I absolutely loved that job, and I and I, I look back at that job as being so important to my DJ career because what it did, it allowed me to have a, a lot of quality control in the amount and the type of event that I booked myself on, because I already I had an income. Yeah, so, you weren't worried. You weren't. You weren't worried about check to check. You had yes. the income behind you. And I and I always, you know, I had a an idea of how I wanted to be perceived. And listen, don't get me wrong. Sometimes there's a lot of it that's out of your. It's out of your hands, and you can only control the bits that you can control. But I definitely was like, right. Well, I don't want to take everything. I want to make myself a little bit exclusive, which means that. You know, not everybody's going to want to pay you what you want to earn, you know, which is fine. This is it's promoter's prerogative, right? Um, so the job allowed me to be able to pick and choose my gigs. Um, and 
yeah, it, it, it stood me in good stead. I mean, it did mean that I had to have a few difficult conversations, but I bet, I bet. Sometimes, sometimes you've got to crack eggs, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. But in the transitioning point of that job where you're leaving daytime work for nighttime work, were you still singular in the sense of the DJ? Were you just spoony as spoony, or you were already now as all three of you together working? Yeah, we were we were working at this stage. Um, we, we were, you know, it's very early on in 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 the Dream Team's life together. But yeah, we were the Dream Team at that stage. And I think coming fresh off the back of never have been out of work and always had a nine to five. What I took with me was a lot of you know admin skills admin smarts call it whatever you like so that there could be structure to what we were doing even though we didn't have an agent so i then kind of became our in-house agent unofficially that i would kind of negotiate or deal with admin or you know contracts or agreements or whatever it was so um yeah that kind of became my my job again unofficially in the group so you became the solicitor the salesperson well you know what i mean I, 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 I would say the dick the idiot the one that we have to argue but you know my, my thing lenny was that we've got something we've got something good and we i have a vested interest in it being protected and i was going to defend you know the dream team honor whether that be collectively or individually with everything that i had and you know the boys the boys trusted me implicitly, like so much love. There's like a real brotherly love with Timmy and Mikey. And I, I actually think that's a massive part of, you know, our success. Timmy and Mikey come to you. Whose idea is to formulate this dream team? Is it all together at the same time over a, over a, over a drink? Let's all, let's align together. We're stronger as a three or. Well, it never kind of happened. What, what what happened was we we started sort of speaking to each other across the airwaves during the show. You know, shout out to Timmy, or I heard Timmy play this record last Saturday and I went and bought it, or my show was on a Friday night, or I might say on Sunday I'm going to listen to Mikey and Jason. Mikey used to do a show with, with uh, another UK garage legend called Jason K, who sadly passed away. Um, and I would shout them out. And then we just built up a little bit of an on-air rapport and then sort of once every, I don't know, a couple of months, the station DJs would meet, we'd have a, have a bit of a, a gathering. And when I first met Timmy and Mikey, it worked out that we lived sort of within a one mile triangle of each other. So we then just started hanging out and making mixtapes, doing like back to back tapes uh, together, of which I've still got on that, um, that were recorded, I think this might be sort of early 97, 96, something like that um we built up a bit of a, a friendship and then i got a phone call to put together a lineup that i mentioned a, a new venue in east london called the powerhouse and that's where i had to write and record the ad to which i coined the phrase london's dream team and that's kind of how it started and that's what i want to make sure because people want to make sure they know how that happened you know because you know we've seen the name mm -hmm. hear about the name we also realized a little bit later on from the success of you guys playing out all over London and England and pushing that heavy bass line sound out there, making the records, as we've seen, like, for example, you're getting the deals with Deconstruction and, you know, you're putting stuff on for Liberty Tony. Is that if I remember correct, is that Tony Portelli for Libya? Exactly. Good knowledge. Good remembering. I can't remember. I can't believe I remember. My God. Yeah. Tony yeah, Portelli. Um, you can see there. Did you see the difference in the spelling? Right. Yeah. Let's. Oh. So, so you yep. got you got the Dream Team with the EA, but then the record that was released on Deconstruction is with the two E's. So solicitor, when did you decide to say, or all three of you say, we need to change the E? A to the E. Well, I did that again. That was my decision because I didn't want it being confused with um, with the Dream Team. I wanted to drop the London because I thought that would just be too restrictive and not inclusive enough. And then I thought that if we're then going to be the Dream Team, well, you already had the Dream Team um, 
the American basketball team at the Olympics. So then I thought if we go with the dream team with double E and double E, it will be uniquely ours. So that was it. No, it was a good call. It was a very good call you did that. Got lucky. So now, they say, Lenny, sometimes you're better to be lucky than good. <laughs> okay, lucky call, mate. Lucky call. <laughs> so not too far down the road, BBC comes knocking at the door, if I remember correctly, because I was impressed when I heard that, because I was in England when that happened. I was like, wow, check this out. Yeah. You guys are making UKG legitimate now. Yeah, that was on white radio. Because let's talk for real. It's not yeah. a black thing. It's it's now going on white radio. So talk about that. Tell us how, how that went down. So that was that was a real big that was a real big moment. I mean, it was massive for us as a collective, but it was massive for our genre as well because largely um, UK garage had been. I don't know, disparagingly and frowned upon as being just a London scene. And we knew it wasn't because we were playing, you know, well, all over the country. Let me break into you. But why was it being disparaged? What was going on with the music and the scene at that time? Well, I mean, the, the scene, it, I say it's, I say it's disparagingly referred to as, as a London scene because Birmingham, Wolverhampton, Sheffield, Leeds, Huddersfield, Cardiff, Ipswich, Nor uh, Norwich, um, Reading, Swindon, Swansea, Bognor. UK Garage was massive. So there was no way that it could only be London. And I think when I say disparagingly, it's because it, they were just trying to make it smaller than it actually was. And I knew it was a national thing because... We were DJing all over the country, all three of us, all the time. And that's not just us. The aforementioned Norris the Boss Windross, Matt Jam Lamont, Carl Tuffenough Brown, EZ. You know, these guys were playing at the time all over the country, um, if not abroad as well. So prior to um prior to Radio One coming, we were on we we're on KISS, we we're on KISS FM for about 18 months, maybe two years. We had three shows a week between us there were two dream team shows and i had a show on my own um we then did a six month stint on on galaxy which we took because we wanted we wanted uh kiss to syndicate our show nationally and they didn't wouldn't couldn't call it whatever you like and galaxy wanted us to do a show on their network which wasn't london based so I, I sort of suggested that, look, I think we've got London covered because we play in London all the time. We all had London residencies. So people, our presence in London was taken care of. But this is a perfect opportunity to take the music out of the capital and support the DJs, you know, around the UK that have been championing UK Garage. So, for instance, in Swansea, you had the K2 family or you had... Andy Ward and B15 Project in the Midlands, Birmingham, or you might have had Andy J in Huddersfield or Injecta in Manchester, all loving UK Garage. We now could broadcast to those guys and the people that love them every single week, which we thought was massive and more important than not. And we did that for about six months. And then Radio One approached us and said, look, we'd like you guys to, to come on the network. And yeah, that was it. And you know everyone knows what happens when magical BBC Radio One comes. It yeah, I mean, changed listen, your life completely. Yeah, it did. It it did. We did so many great things um, whilst we were on there. Um, yeah, two thousand January two thousand was our first show. Um, you know, we we went off and done TV shows. We hung out with A listers and interviewed A listers and had phone calls from the rich and the famous of the world because we were these guys on national radio. And at a time when it's really important to put it into context, there was no listening to tunes online. There was no Spotify. If you really wanted to hear something hot, new and fresh, you had to do it via a DJ, a tastemaker. And, you know, for, for our sound, that was us. And uh, yeah. It's, it, it was beautiful times. It was beautiful being on air with Timmy and Mike every week. Um, you know, the personalities and the, the, the sense of humour. I mean, looking at that picture, you'd never believe that 
all three of these guys like to laugh, but we had some unbelievable giggles on that station. How long did you reign for on Radio One with the, with the show? Yeah, we was I was I was there for six years. Um because I, I stayed on an extra two years and did a a mainstream show. Um, but we were there together, I think, for four years. Yeah. So now talk about see to every good thing, as like with the roller coasters, you go up. We must come down eventually. Can never stay up, 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 up forever. Yeah. So four years on, two years solo. What happens to this illustrious dream team? So the dream team on national radio was no longer, I think, to come 2005. But as a collective of DJs, we were still very much out there doing our thing, whether it be in you know, Iron Appa, uh, not by 2006, we'd stopped going to Cyprus, but still doing Ibiza, still doing clubs in and around the UK. Um, but we just were no longer broadcasting as a collective um, on music radio. I was still doing BBC, but sports. So I was doing BBC Five Live because I had a passion for football and started working for BBC Five Live in 2003. So I did that for seven years um, with a few years concurrent with with Radio One. It's amazing that you were able to step out of the music and go into the sports world. Yeah, you know, know that they don't really know that unless they follow you. They don't know that no. you're doing sports ca uh, commentating. I mean, I still am. I, I still I, I work for the Premier League now and have been doing so for eight or nine seasons. Um, and my current my current contract's going to take me to over ten seasons with the Premier League, and it goes out around the whole world. Um, you know, it goes out in North America, South America, the Middle East, Africa, Asia. Um, so that that's fantastic, and 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 I I really enjoy doing that. But one of my one of my motivations and inspirations for diversifying and not just being boxed into He's just a DJ. He's just a music DJ. What is he doing talking about football? Um, and this might surprise you was the great Jamie Foxx. And I, I looked at Jamie Foxx thinking he's a brilliant actor. He's a brilliant comedian. He's a musician. Like, why can't you just do what you want to do if you're good at doing it? And I thought, you know what? If he's good enough for Jamie, it's good enough for me. So, you know, thank you, Jamie Foxx, if you ever see this. So Jamie Foxx mused you. You used him as your muse. He was my muse, man. I thought you were going to tell me you, you sat down, you poured a glass of bourbon with him, and he said to you, bro, you can do this. And I, I, I didn't have to ever have that conversation with it with him, but I did, I did get a chance to um, work with him. It, it was on the... He was freezing Spider-Man, wasn't he? And he came over to do a um he came over to do a junket promo for the film. And I sort of hosted the red carpet there and and DJ'd at the event. And he was there and he came into the DJ booth. And you know, I didn't I didn't gush over him uh, too much, but yeah, he's a real, you know, he's a real, real superstar. And for me, you know, that was a classic example of someone who you know, at that stage, depending on whatever your measure of success is, had had a successful career. And yet I was being inspired or had been inspired by someone like Jamie Foxx. So Spoonie, you saw you. It's like you can read the tea leaves, as they <laughs> say, like you can actually maybe like you call it a lucky break and lucky moves and this and that. But you're pretty. Let's put it like this. You plan pretty well. Because you're always thinking forward, never looking back, it seems like. I mean, you know, the UKG thing is a stepping stone, a big part of your life. But it's not the beginning and end. You know, I'm hearing other things seem to be in the roundabout for you, in a sense. You know, like, where do you see yourself taking this now? Because... I mean, I'm I'm assuming, you know, between radio presenter and all that stuff and doing sports, 
You actually thinking about it? <laughs> Someone may laugh. Are you actually thinking about acting too? Are you is that is that something you're thinking about going into? I mean, if I'm completely honest with you, I've already done a couple of cameo appearances, um, acting wise. I mean, I used to go to drama school as a kid, and I actually stopped going to drama school because I was spending so much time out of the house because of my football soccer commitments. Um, one area that I would love to explore more, and I'm going to, is uh, comedy. So I'm gonna. I've already. I did a small comedy workshop where I did some stand up, and I'm gonna do. I'm definitely gonna do a little bit more. So Lenny, one day you will see uh, Spoonie, the stand up comedian. You can be up there with Charlie and Eddie. You're I don't know. With that. Jamie Fox, Chris Rock. There you I go. I mean, I grew up with the best. Like I said, I, I'm old enough to remember, you know, Richard Pryor in his prime, Bernie Mac, who, you know, Bernie Mac, if I watch Bernie Mac, Kings of Comedy now, even though I've seen it 50 times, it will make my eyes water. <laughs> Eddie, Eddie Murphy, Raw, brilliant. Oh, you know, now... Oh, we, delirious is no joke. You know, now we live in the greatness and social commentary of Dave Chappelle. So I love... You know, I love I love my comedy, man. Dave I, Chappelle I, changed the game. Yeah, yeah. Brilliance, wittiness, and how he can make something turn something from a negative, make you see it from a different set of eyes. It's like the best. I think one of the best skits were, were I w that he did on his show. I hate to use the word, but he says it. Hanging with the niggas, where he had a white family playing with their last name and he's the and and he comes in as a black man talking and he's shocked by what like how they were all living i mean the craziness when you watch it you go <laughs> you're laughing but you're going oh my god this is crazy this is wrong, this is this, wrong. but this it's wrong. like wrong you know it's it that's why that's why he is so um that's why he's so brilliant because he does things that no one else could and should, but he doesn't care. He just he just does it. He just does it. I I I, I love him. I, I stand a, um I stand by the side and and watch him. And, and I mean, for me, my my favorite one of his was his um, black Klansman. <laughs> yeah, Clayton the blind guy. He's Clayton not. Rigsby. He he, he he was he was he was a Klansman, but he didn't know he was black. That's like it's the funniest, funniest thing ever. When but, he's talking to that to those white people and they're like, Yeah, they, they talk they tell her that the grandmaster's coming, and then when he comes in, they're like, It's brilliant, man. <laughs> it's, it's him, brilliant. he's the grandmaster. Everybody was like, I know. <laughs> Yo, if anybody I want to meet is that man. Yeah. And again, he, you know, Dave, he's one of those people that I want to wait to meet him until I can meet him in a relaxed environment, the right environment where he's he's just being called, he's not being hassled or pulled from pillar to post because I'd love to have a conversation with him like and a proper man conversation, you know? Uh, but yeah, like I said, comedy, it's something that in a, in a, in the world we live in where there are, so many wrongs and so many dark days potentially to be able to laugh and smile about things it's a very powerful tool and those names that i've mentioned you know we could put kevin hart in there as well those names just yeah they, they they've given me so much joy down the years very special people with a very out of all the english comics who do you feel holds to the to the american guys i mean the, the, so I would always talk about the Americans being the best, uh, like the stand up. Um, but I have always and I've often enjoyed the British um, acting, the comedy actors, the sitcoms. So it might be people like Morecambe and Wise. Uh, Tommy Cooper was a brilliant stand up comedian. Unbelievable. Um, then you had shows like Only Fools and Horses, uh, David Jason and Nicholas Lindhurst. These are legendary TV programs um, for humor, but but sitcoms. Um, but you know, in later times, um, 
Mickey Flanagan was a favourite of mine. I used to love Jack D because Jack D used to make me laugh, but he had this most serious face, like straight deadpan. Um, yeah, they, he, they, they, were, they were some of my favourites. One that stands out for the Americans, we always laugh about from the Benny 70s. Hill. Benny Hill. Great Benny Hill, man. I knew you were going to say that. Great Benny Hill. I mean, that show was on here all the time. Yeah. But, you know, Benny, that that, that comedy was, you know, very slapstick, which it's kind of thing. But there were some, you know, the funny scenes. I always used to love when he used to pat the little bald head guy on the, on, on the top of his head. I don't know why I used to like that so much. But, yeah, Benny Hill, again, another... Um, another icon, another British comedy icon. So now that we know that you're a movie actor and all these wonderful things, is there anything that is in the pipeline or dream factor in your mind that you say, I'm going to one day achieve this. This is the last time my bucket list. I need to have this. I think professionally, one of the things that I want to do, I definitely want to do some stand up and write myself a nice, uh, a nice piece for stand up and perform it in, in front of on a big stage to people that wouldn't be expecting me to do something like that. Um, I've got a young friend of mine called Andrew Mensa who is actually a, a professional comedian, and I played him the um, my performance after my workshop, and he was very pleasantly, I might add, surprised that to to what I did. So I'm gonna, I am gonna go and do that. Um, it's nice taking yourself out of your comfort zone every now and again and there is nothing lonelier in fact the two loneliest places i've ever been uh in my life are on stage to do stand-up and in a boxing ring for a charity fight because for all the training for all the laughs when you're in the workshop when you actually get in there you don't have any music to help you boy yeah right it's you in the microphone you're on your own yeah baby with a tomato or potato coming at you at another moment Woo! Do or die. Woo! Can't uh, pull out that big record right now and say, wait, I'll pull this together with one record. No. It's like mic so, drops and changes everything. So this is the thing, right? So I, I stood before you're, you're due to go on and there's, you know, your mind starts playing tricks with you as it always does that moment before performance. And I was like, right, what's the worst thing that can, you know, the worst thing that can happen here? And then I kind of had to find some fail safes. One being, I'm not a professional comedian. So if I don't make people laugh, it's not really what I do. If I don't make people dance, that's another thing altogether, right? Because I, I play music. Then I thought to myself, if I try a joke and it doesn't work, that would be like the DJ equivalent of playing a record and it doesn't work or trying to mix and it doesn't work. And then you come back from that. So once I'd... Once I'd had that rationale in my head, I was able to go forward unrestricted because I was like, well, it, it, not really too much can go wrong that you've not experienced before. Uh, <laughs> uh, but you know what? You're well seasoned enough now. You've done enough things in your life to, to be able to, add, as we call it, air living or Go to yeah. things that you know in your in your trick your trick box in your mind. So it's not like you're gonna get that initial stage fright. You've already way, way past that in your yeah. game. You know, it's a matter of fine-tuning the craft. Can I do this? And is it legitimately acceptable? Yeah. What I'm trying to get across, like, you know, and I understand why you said you're playing it for certain people to see the reaction, because of course. None of us want to go out there and look like a horse is behind. <laughs> <laughs> and smell like one even worse, you know, stinking out of place. Nobody wants to do that, Lenny. Is the dream team coming back together? We never split. We still, we still. You know do... what I mean by that. You know what I mean. Yeah, you know. we, we, we still do things. I mean, um, we did a gig. We did a gig like Timmy's. Timmy's uh, in the church now. So Timmy's. Oh, yeah. Largely What's that largely... all about? What do you mean Timmy's in the church? He goes yeah, to Timmy... church. Yeah, no, he's he, he's you know he's de he's devoted and dedicated the rest of his life um, to his Lord, which means that going into nightclubs and some of the exposure um, temptations of nightclubs 
and people in nightclubs cause is that to be a little bit of a conflict. So, but did he previous to becoming, I guess, a deacon or or a reverend, or, did something happen to push him that way to find the Lord, or was it just something that was burning inside? He'd been in the church before. I think he he he, he, he reached a point where he just wanted a a greater purpose and 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 that was it um you know but we're like i said we're 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 still brothers we will talk and play music together we have a laugh and we have a giggle but just being in the nightclub environment um just causes i think a little bit of internal conflict um between his beliefs and how he wants to live his future and that's that's my mikey's the reverend or timmy Timmy, he's, so he's not a reverend. He's what's called in his church, church and elder. Okay, so okay, he's a church elder. Yeah, and that's Timmy and Mikey. And what did Mikey I want to be? Again, we, we still we still do shows every now and again. You know, he's uh, you know M- Mikey's a Mikey's a real music man. So prior to prior to UK Garage coming to the fore in the UK, they were you know a few different underground scenes. So you had in the sort of 80s you had the soul sound systems to which mikey was in one of the top three sound systems in in london then you had the hardcore scene that came a little bit later than that and again he was in one of the top three outfits in that scene an outfit called top buzz mikey was the founder of top buzz and then he was a member of the dream team which was you know, there or thereabouts with regards to UK Garage. So that's testament to his music knowledge, his music taste, his ability to spot tomorrow's hit today or last week. Um, yeah, and he, he, he's just on it. Mikey's just a genuine music person. So Mikey is a professional muso. He's right in it to win it. Yeah, Mikey's in it, man. You, on the other hand... Uh, what I call Hollywood. Uh oh. <laughs> we, we know music, fashion, football, movies, comedy. You're becoming like what I'm going to say, The Rock. You sound like The Rock now. Yeah, but you know what? You know what it is, Lenny. I, yeah, hey, wait. I've, absolutely. Hey, wait. I've, I've, we need I've, you I've, to sing. Are you a singer as well, or no? No, I can't. Okay, oh, no. okay. Right. I can go like this. No singing. Um, I, I listen. I, I like to be diverse with 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 my interests. I don't think we should be boxed or pigeonholed with with, with anything. So, on for that reason, um, I just like to do different bits and pieces. That said, I'm very much into integrity. So, if you're going to do something, you know, do it properly. I don't I don't do anything because I want to be well known. If I get into a conversation with Something about soccer or football without too long gone, you'll go, right, he's, yeah, he, he knows his sport. He knows his stuff. You know, so, one thing I want to ask you about, you know, when speaking of when you're when you're commentating on a professional football level, and I notice not just you, but, you know, famous guys like in America, Howard Cosell, any, you always have statistics. Are they feeding you that stuff? Or is that something you guys know, like the players and things? Sometimes it's a bit of both because you, if I knew I was going to come on today to speak to you about football and I had a certain viewpoint or an argument, sometimes you go and get statistical information to support that. Sometimes you might have a producer telling you stuff, but you know, the the best people know, know their stuff to support their argument. They don't know every stat about everybody, but if I wanted to come and talk about my beloved Liverpool, I would have certain stats that I knew based on their performances, the probability that they were going to win at home because they haven't lost at home for 25 games or something like that. So the intel set before you you step up into the chair and start talking. Basically. Yeah, and you know, and you know, some of it is some of it is just knowledge that you've accumulated and you accumulate because it's a genuine interest of yours. You know, so if I said to you today, you know, tell me Michael Jackson's three three big albums in chronological order, you wouldn't have to research that because you most probably could go 
yeah, I know Off The Wall came out, then Thriller came out, and then Bad came out after that. You wouldn't have to check that out because you're into that stuff. Right, you know you know your craft. But if, if I got to tell you about Beirut stats, I got to make sure I check that before I talk to you about Yankee stuff. Unless you're a Babe Ruth fan, because I can tell right. you, you know, there will be some people who are fans of Babe Ruth in a way that we're a fan of soul and funk, that they wouldn't have to research some Babe Ruth stuff, just like we wouldn't have to research, um, you know, some Michael Jackson stuff. We know that Quincy and Rod Temperton produced Off the Wall and Thriller largely, and, you know, Phil Filling Gaines played keys on this track. Like, we could go through that. You know, and, and, and we'll we, even go further to say Rod Temperman was part of Heat Wave yeah, and all yeah. those songs, right? And we can, it, th yeah, the disco and all that. And and I'm with you. And that's why I was just asking because a lot of times, unless you're behind a teleprompter or you're doing this, you don't really know what's going on. And yeah. that's why I wanted to ask that question. And being that you're in that different part of the game, you're not ad libbing all the time. You know. No. No, and I, and I think the, the the key in the craft is to to make it conversational. So you've got a good producer who will be giving you stuff to enhance the program, enhances your reputation, enhances his or hers reputation at the same time. Because you know, if you go in there and you don't come across well, an element of that might reflect back on your producer. So I've been fortunate to work with some excellent producers who will, you know, they will help you and make you feel comfortable whilst you're on air, so you come across as comfortable and, and knowledgeable. It's basically, as they always say, you're as good as your staff. There you go. There the support you go. team, if it's not right, you're out. See right? you later, baby. On that note, we want to thank you for such an in-depth conversation and into the world of Spoonie. Now, in, in commentating... Are you known as Spoonie or we go by your real name? What are we doing? Yeah, on the, they actually, so when I was on Five Live, right. I was known as Spoonie. Um, but on the, for the Premier League, they largely call me JJ or Jonathan Joseph. Let's go to our correspondent, Jonathan, known yeah. as AKA Spoonie in the... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's, that, that's quite funny as well because on the show it'll be JJ and then someone will find me on Twitter or Instagram and go, wait a minute, you're the same guy. It was so, it's yep. a little bit, it's a little bit of a, you know, Bruce Wayne Batman situation that I've got running, you know? <laughs> and that's the thing with social media, kind of like, oh, well, what are we sporting now? Are we sporting JJ? Are we sporting Spoonie? Which is the one that we want to, you yeah, know, Spoonie, make? DJ Spoonie is on Instagram. Um, and it's on Twitter. So, yeah, that's the... Yeah. Spoonie, most important part, people who are music fans and producers and DJs, how they get their music to you? Because I know you like to hear new music for the shows. How, yeah. how is that possible? So you could either... You can send me a message, um, usual ways on Twitter or on Instagram. You could email me... Um, management at djspoonie.com um, and Pav will get that and he can eat, you know, you'll forward that on to me. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, well, I'm quite accessible. People can find me, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just the guy, just, just that guy. Yeah. He lives in the back cave people checking his computer. <laughs> He's right there solving the crimes. He is your man of the hour. Dude. DJ Spoonie, thank you so much for Many Thank Letting you. Letting kind of true house stories again, a legend in his own time, who is now going to create another legendary situation for himself very soon. So, watch out for Mr. Spoonie. He may shock you, and you may be going to one of his open mic at the Madison Square Garden, or <laughs> or maybe never know at the ministry. Maybe the ministry of sound will set up in the in the room seating. For, for, instead of us going to go and dance, we'll be taken by his microphone, his comedic skills. On that note, we'll catch you all next time right here on True House Stories. Take care. And thank you again, Mr. Spoonie. Thank you, Lenny. Talk to you, mate.